I, I just want to say one, one further note about the, the special issue that I think all of you have uh, or will get. Um, it, actually, it actually developed out of a, a conversation about a year ago I was having with Jeff um, in which I asked him a, uh, a very simple question. I said, what would James Madison make of our current moment? Um, he answered in a 6,000 word, perfectly formed essay. <laughs> But you cut that. I, I just, I just taped it on my phone, and then we published it. It was great. It was so easy. Um, it's not true. But that, that's the, the that 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 grew and grew and grew until we have uh, 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 what I think is a really fantastic issue with uh, with Jeff and Ibram and Stephen Breyer and Ann Applebaum and a whole bunch of other people in it. Um, but I, in for this conversation, um, let's uh, let's go right at the, 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 the topic of our first conversation, which is we seem to be in a crisis, um, and I want to ask each of you in turn uh, what you think um, the, the most pressing, uh, the most, the, the, but what is the most pressing aspect of this crisis? What is the greatest threat to the continuity of our constitutional form of government? Why don't we start with you, Jeff, and maybe you could um, channel the channel the Madisonian uh, uh, quality a bit, and then we'll go to Ruth and Ibram. Well, thank you for asking this really important question. What would Madison think of democracy today? And what inspired me to the answer was a passage from Federalist 55. In all very large assemblies, of no matter what character controlled, passion never fails to wrest the scepter from reason. Even if every Athenian had been Socrates, Athens would still have been a mob. So Athens uh, is on Madison's mind. He's afraid of the failed democracies of Greece and Rome. He's convinced that direct democracies, where popular passions can be unchecked, will lead to demagogues. And that's why he devises the entire American system to create cooling mechanisms that slow down public discourse so that reasonable majorities can prevail. And what the piece tries to do is note that all of the cooling mechanisms Madison put in place are under siege. Congress is polarized than, more than any time since the Civil War with red and blue America living in uh, digital echo chambers and uh, separate communities. The presidency is communicating directly with the people. A tweeting president is a Madisonian nightmare because presidents are not supposed to communicate directly with the people. And the Supreme Court, with the prospect of five to four Republican versus Democratic decisions, represents the antithesis of the bipartisan legitimacy that Madison and Hamilton hoped. And most importantly, social media, Facebook and Twitter, have sped up public deliberation so quickly that they make possible the formation of digital mobs, undermining the advantages of the extended republic, which Madison thought would make it hard for mobs to discover each other and organize and he thought passion could dissipate before they form. One really important point. For Madison, a mob can be a majority or a minority. A majority or a minority. The fact that we may have uh, parties that are ruling uh, that don't have a support of the majority of the whole is not an answer to the Madisonian problem. He defined a mob as any group animated by passion rather than reason, devoted to self-interest rather than the public good. And that is what we are having now, and that is the terrible crisis that our Constitution faces. By, by the way, I just want to note that I also can quote large tracts of the Federalist Papers. <laughs> <laughs> but I, it, it, I, just, I just make a personal choice not to. It's, beca uh, it's thank become you, a party trick. No, 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 it is a, it's one of the, only in Washington is that a party trick, by the <laughs> way. Yeah. Um, At 10 in the morning. Ruth, um, the biggest threat. So um, I'm here today as your designated quasi-optimist, um, but and we can get to that later and sort of talk about the shreds of optimism that I'm clinging to. Um, but the biggest threat may be a corollary or an outgrowth of the mob that Jeff is so eloquently disclaiming about, um, which is the wobbliest leg of the school stool, our feckless legislative branch. Um, hope Jeff Flake is not in the hall yet. Don't want to <laughs> hurt anybody's feelings. Um, if you think about the um, elements of the national arrangement that have done well too adequately over the last difficult months. The judiciary, well too adequately, and we'll see how that proceeds. The media, more well than adequately, um, despite the scary fact that last month we had one, one White House press briefing. That is a scary 
part of our constitutional arrangement, but um, nonetheless, we persist. And then, you, you know, you have the excesses of an unchecked presidency, which leads me to the feckless branch, the legislature, which, um, and I don't think it's passion that's motivating them, though it may be the passion of the mob that is creating this arrangement, it is fear. They know what is right, and they are afraid, too many of them, too often, to stand up and say it. Um, they, they kind of, they look at it in a, many, many lawmakers that I speak to in a crass real politic situation of if I speak up, he, meaning he, um, <laughs> who shall not be named, and his mobs of followers and his Twitter followers will besiege my office through social media, through telephones, and they will crush me at the ballot box. They will not necessarily crush me at the ballot box in the general election, but we have this unfortunate primary situation that's going on. So they are, this, we have an arrangement that I think that Madison and his buddies could not have conceived of, and it's not unique to this moment, but it is uniquely bad at this moment, where we have a legislative branch that is too often cowering in fear of doing what it knows to be the right thing. So that's my big, um, from the gloomy piece of my hat, that's the biggest threat. Um, Ibram, um, in your excellent piece for The Atlantic, uh, you, you talk at length about what remains America's original sin. Could you just give us in a minute or two um, the thesis um, and talk about the way in which uh, uh, the perpetuation of racism prevents us from being the more perfect union that we all dream of? Sure. I, I think I, for the piece, of course, I, I decided to use it. Lincoln's famous house divided speech in, in 1858, in which he made the case that a house divided itself, divided against itself, cannot stand. Uh, and he believed this government cannot permanently endure half slave and half free or become all one thing or all the other. And, and I made the case in, in the piece that in, instead of thinking of the divide right now between slavery and anti-slavery, we should think of the divide between racist and anti-racist. And, and this sort of original sin and this sort of persisting division is essentially between those who are led to believe uh, that the problem in our society is, is people, particularly people who don't look like them, particularly people in, the, in who don't live in their neighborhoods. Uh, and, and others, I think, have come to recognize that, that the problem is policy. And, and really, because I think from the founding of this country, we've had racial inequity. Um, and people have been trying to understand why this inequity exists and persists. And we've been arguing about it from the beginning. Is it bad policy or bad people? And, and, and fundamentally, we're going to have to come together and recognize uh, that it's bad policy. Uh, and that because by thinking it's bad people, we fundamentally remain divided. And it's very difficult for a nation <laughs> to persist and endure permanently uh, with such searing divisions. Jeff, uh, add on to that, if you will. I, I'm wondering if uh, if the system was designed to um, to grapple with the level of demographic change, change in relations between gender, change in differences from region to region, the, the formation of all kinds of, uh, faction is what Madison was worried about, uh, faction broadly defined. Is this country simply becoming too, and I use this word in a technical narrow sense, too diverse in what it is and what the, what the needs of different regions and different peoples are, or the fears of different peoples are, to actually unify around a single creed, a creed encapsulated in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Uh, Ibram is so right to cite Lincoln as well as Madison, and Lincoln is directly channeling Madison when in his speech, which I found since the piece came out and after reading uh, your amazing piece, Ibram, 
1838, the Young Men's Lyceum of Springfield, Lincoln is afraid of mobs. He's seeing Elijah Lovejoy, the abolitionist newspaper editor, lynched uh, uh, to protect his presses. He's seeing African Americans being uh, lynched as well as white people. And he says, the mobocratic spirit is in the land. We are being governed by passion rather than reason. I am afraid that even people of goodwill who have allegiance to the country will be seduced by demagogues like Caesar and Alexander, just as Madison feared demagogues, so did Lincoln. And he says to these young men of Springfield, the only solution is reverence for the Constitution and the laws. Let it be taught from every cradle. Let every mother and father teach it to every prattling babe. We must imbibe this reverence for the Constitution. It has to become a kind of political religion, Lincoln says. So it's an astonishing speech. And it reminds us that things have been very bad before. We're more polarized than at any time since the Civil War, but we were this polarized before. We are more polarized right now, in your view, than any time since the, the lead up to the Civil War. It's, it's actually just after the Civil War. Nor Norbert McCarthy from Princeton has run the numbers. And after the Civil War, the divide between uh, Republicans and Democrats was as great as it is since then. It hasn't been this great since then. In 1960, in Congress, 50% of the most conservative Democrats overlapped with the most liberal Republicans. Today, there's no overlap. So we've been there before, but of course we had a civil war the last time, and the and, and the question is. So it, it is a question if 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 this decade is analogous in some ways. I'm trying to be very cautious about the way I phrase this. Uh, if this is the 1850s, then what's the what's the next decade that we're looking at? I mean, do you see? Do either of you see any cause to believe that we're going to? wake up one morning and go, you know what, we need to reimpose restraint on our behavior and our speech in order to recognize the fact that we're trying to live together in one country under one system. Do you see anything to make you happy? <laughs> <laughs> anything at all, really, it's early. Let's try. Well, I mean, I see people resisting. Um, I see young people uh, sort of imagining and dreaming of a different world. Um, but on the other hand, you know, I see people arming themselves. I see people joining organizations uh, that imagine that their people are experiencing a genocide and they're seeking to take America back. And they see their president uh, basically championing that sort of effort. Um, and, and I also see those people uh, terrorizing more Americans than, than any other group of people. And, and I also see Americans, and particularly white Americans, particularly middle income white Americans, imagining that a more anti-racist, egalitarian America is against their self-interest, which actually is not. Um, and so there, there are so many different ways in which you know, I see it getting worse, and, and we see the violence. Uh, and, and really, that was, when we think about the 1850s, a lot of the violence was occurring on plantations. I mean, there was a lot of resistance going on on plantations. There was a lot of uh, pro-slavery theorists who were upset about abolitionists in the North speaking out against slavery. I mean, there was all sorts of violence continuing to bubble up. We're going to take questions from the audience in a couple of minutes, but let me go to Ruth just for uh, for a comment on on this. Um, and this is a question that I get, you get, anybody from the so-called mainstream media gets this question all the time, which is, how do you reach that 30 to 40 percent of Americans, mainly white, overwhelmingly white, um, mainly not coastal, quote unquote, coastal elites? Uh, how do you reach them with what you think of as your fact-based discourse about the way the country is going about the divisions in the country, about the, the behavior of the president. Um, have you figured out how to bridge yes, that divide? Yes, but I can't tell you. You have a formula? <laughs> <laughs> but if you join Amazon Prime, however. But go into this a little bit. I, I'm curious to know how you think about this, because it does seem to me that, that, that we can divide up America into many different kind of tribes right now, but there is that tribe, the tribe that no longer believes what we believe to be flawed, but, but earnest effort to present observable empirical reality uh, so that people can make informed decisions. How do, you, how do you get over that chasm? So I do want to answer that question, but I want to sort of get into my designated optimist role for just a second to this say. This is self-designation, by the yeah. way. I did not designate. <laughs> um, you did, but that's OK. Well, we'll um, agree to disagree. But self-designation as well, um, which is not to say naive dupe. Um, I'm just designated optimist. 1860s, but also let's recall 
1960s. That was a, 1968 was a very scary moment, a very scary year, rioting in streets, college students rioting and killed, a nation really torn apart. We've been in bad places at many points in our history and we have healed. Um, I think one, and we are at a bad point now, but it, you know, you, and it is a point that Trump is obviously both a cause and a symptom. We got Trump because we were not in a good place as a nation going into the election, but at the same time, three million more votes for Hillary Clinton, um, oddities of a antiquated electoral college system. I'm not blaming you, but you are the <laughs> Mr. Constitution. I just convened the discussions. Um, and you know, you know, a, a bunch of bad, potentially malign acts that yielded this. We could be having a not completely different conversation, but a significantly different conversation. And I think back to the night that feels so long ago now that Barack Obama was elected president of the United States and we thought of our country in a very different way. So that's a, a little bit of the happy talk gloss on, you know, a situation that I agree is not the perfect moment now. One thing that increasingly concerns me that we've alluded to but haven't talked about on that is the role of Whoops, the role of technology, she said, speaking into her <laughs> microphone, um, in exacerbating all of this. It exacerbates the mob. It exacerbates the regional demographic sorting that creates the, tri the kind of pre existing tribalism. Um, so well, that is on the downside. We're going to talk about that in the next panel. But go, go so, to this issue. So, of the on, so I oversee the op ed page at the wa pages at the Washington Post and the opinion section online. And we are we have been since the election, during the election, and especially since the election, extremely dedicated to the proposition that we need to that people can say liberal Washington Post, even the liberal Washington Post sometimes. And people can dismiss us, starting with and trickling down from the president, but that we need to be, and I know you've tried this, Jeff, um, the, a home for vibrant, intellectually honest, robust debate that includes and reflects the reality that 40% of people voted for Donald Trump. And, and we are serving it to people. And you know what? Um, it suggests that our readers wherever they are in the political spectrum, are willing to consume across the political spectrum. And there will be people who never go to the Washington Post, but we're, we need to, and I think all of our colleagues across the media landscape, need to serve people two things. One is facts, because facts really matter. And the second is respectful discourse across the ideological divide, because if we can't have that, we really are in trouble. Um, we're going to go to questions. Do we have any oh, right here? Um, please also keep these questions short in the form of a question. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Andy Bloom, avid reader. Uh, some have called for a constitutional convention and say one could be within four or five years. What are your thoughts on that? Madison was avidly opposed to another convention. He thought it was a miracle that the first one worked. He, he, he thought it was divine providence, and he was really afraid. Is that because it was done in secrecy, largely? Secrecy was crucial. Imagine tweet, a tweeting convention. And it's, this is a central point, uh, that um, if the South had tweeted out their position before the negotiations happened, both sides would have dug in their heels and compromise would have been impossible. The fact that it was secret was necessary, and many think that the transparency of Congress has contributed to polarization. But Madison thought that a second convention would be composed of the same state legislators who were creating mobs in the states, and they might repeal the whole thing. Now, 27 uh, states have called for a constitutional convention for a balanced budget amendment. You only need seven more, if, I, if, if, if that's right. So you could, in theory, have one. It's not inconceivable. We've had debates at the National Constitution Center. And I should say, by the way, I've got to quickly explain what we are. The Constitution Center is the only place in America created by Congress to bring liberals and conservatives together for constitutional education and debate. We have these amazing debates in Philadelphia and across the country and online. And this online constitution that brings together the top liberals and conservatives to write about every clause of the Constitution, describing areas of agreement and disagreement. But for our should we have a constitutional convention 
election debate, the audience voted before, initially everyone was for it, and then when David Super of Georgetown Law School got up and said, imagine at this moment you really want to run the risk of a rogue convention repealing the First Amendment and the whole thing, the audience changed its mind and voted against. But you could have one, it would take either a vote of two thirds of uh, uh, both uh, houses of Congress, which is unlikely to happen because Congress doesn't want to uh, uh, restrict itself in this way, or uh, two-thirds of uh, the state legislatures could call a convention of the states, and then that would have to be ratified by three-quarters of the state legislatures or three-quarters of conventions held in each state. And the final thing to say is even if the convention goes rogue, it's unlikely that a totally crazy proposal could get through three-quarters of the states, so that's the argument for a convention. Right. Either of you? I'm with Madison. <laughs> David Madison? I think I'd like some amendments to this. <laughs> <laughs> Those are in the Atlantic tent. On uh, We can find the new amendments if you want. We're selling them today. Uh, right here. I'm Elizabeth Griffith. I'm a historian. My question, do you think you could name five democratic values that all the tribes of our current nation could agree to? Congress shall make no law respecting freedom of speech, abridging the uh, freedom of conscience, allowing unreasonable searches and seizures, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause, particularly but, describing the place to be searched of the thing to be seized. This it's such no, I I teach this stuff. So, but and this is our now and now the the reveal. You know we have wait, Red Bull stop, back stop, there. Wait, it's it's the Red Bull. This is what's doing. No, no, no. <laughs> But, you know but, what? but wait, I want to I want to no, no, argue. This is the reveal. I, I this, these are the values. These are the values. We ascribe to them. We embrace them. We must revere but, but, them. But Jeff, Jeff, to be fair, Look, we know see. that, Jeff, you've been on college campuses. I've been on college campuses. We, you don't see, in among certain millennials, you don't see a reverence for the idea of a First Amendment uh, in the way that you do see. The people, there's, a, there's a broad school of thought that says that, that freedom of speech is a way that the, uh, is a way that the ruling uh, majority white male overlords of this country used uh, used to suppress marginalized people and marginalized speech. You've heard this argument. I don't even know if you buy the argument, but th these things are not universally understood to be good things anymore. There are, there's agreement. Absolutely. Well, no, no, right, the Jeff, whole, Jeff, the whole, Jeff, we, sorry. No, Jeff, why don't we let you the roof? But that's very people. important. The whole theory of American government is in the second sentence of the Declaration of Independence, which I won't recite, but that is the American creed. Ruth. So Abraham. I think it's, I'm going to go um, dark now. Uh, <laughs> I was getting really I, sunny. I it's just an those. emotional roller coaster up here. I, lo <laughs> I love those words, but I think uh, the very eloquent reasons that you explained why we shouldn't have a constitutional convention now explain why it's a little bit up in the air about whether we really could get the vast agreement on those propositions today. Right. Go to this question on the First Amendment for starters. Well, I, I think. I think one of the things that I think millennials, and I guess I'm a millennial, uh, have been making the case. Always wanted to meet one of you. <laughs> <laughs> is, 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 I think they're not articulating it as such, but, but, but I think what they're saying is that there's a such thing as unfree speech. Um, and unfree speech is speech that is false, uh, that's violent, that's damaging. Um, and, 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 and that's the speech, of course, that they're pushing back against, you know, in their spaces and, and on their campuses. And, and to your sort of point about um, a, a demographic, democratic value, I would say uh, all men are created equal, but I think I would sort of advance that and develop that um, to our time um, to say that all groups are equal. Um, and I think it's very subtle, but it's a very in interesting difference. Because when you say created, that means certain groups become inferior, and so therefore we have to civilize and develop them. But if you say all groups are equal right now, then we can literally talk to each other on the same plane. I want time for one more quick question, if we have it. Yeah, over here. Thank you. Uh, good, good morning. My name is Lane Woolerton 
First off, very impressed, Mr. Rosen, with your um, resusc resuscitation abilities. No, it really is a uh, pleasure. <laughs> I can do the preamble to the Constitution to the uh, to Jingle Bell Rock, but I won't do that. <laughs> Whoa. Um, my question is, there are some out there, my father being one of them, who are conservatives. They say they're not supporters of Donald Trump, but that he is important because he's putting the issues on the table. My question is, is despite all of you know the, the disparity that we have um, and the inability to have civil discourse in this time, is there some productivity to having him in office? Did we need Trump and are we somehow better for it? I realize that's a challenge. Why don't you give three quick answers there? Well, um, I'll, I'll do mine. The, the first thing that comes to mind is something that's happening in my profession that I've never experienced before, which is for all of the attacks on the media as the enemy of the people and how chilling that is, and for all the ferocity of being yelled at by people at Trump rallies as liars and scum, people are coming up and thanking me and my colleagues in a way that I find kind of unsettling and unwarranted, but still really quite lovely. Um, and heartwarming, thanking us for what we do. And I think that kind of goes to the question of whether there is a kind of majority for enduring values. Um, and those thanks are something we didn't get into journalism for. It's not why we do it. But it is a very um, lovely byproduct of this horrible era. And I'd say very briefly that I think for those who are resisting the power uh, in the White House, if there was a different power that they supported, they would sort of not be looking in the mirror for power. Uh, they would not be looking to organize power within their own communities. And I see people doing that all over the country, literally waking up each day and looking in the mirror and saying, how can I change this country, as opposed to expecting someone uh, in Washington, D.C. to do it for them. The Constitution Center is nonpartisan, so we can't take a position on our current president, but I can say with total nonpartisan certainty, it is a healthy thing for democracy that all of you now understand constitutional structure matters. Institutions matter. It is not a joke to have the Senate blow itself up through polarization. It's not a joke to have the possibility of a Supreme Court deciding cases by five to four liberal conservative votes. We have an opportunity, in fact, a duty to study this document. All of these wonky things you said you sang the jingle from you know, school. Separation of powers, checks and balances, federalism, even the contracts clause, which is designed to stop state mobs from uh, favoring debtors over creditors, all these are central to the survival of the American American Republic, it is very serious. And if that is a byproduct of our current vexations, then we have the president to thank. I want to thank these three great panelists, and we'll see you again shortly. Thank you very, very much.